Medicine's greatest secret is our inner healing potential, and it's most powerful under anesthesia. When we let go of the reality, we think we know. Hello, wishing everyone a happy new year. Dr. Anthony Cave, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And our story today starts with a patient, a young woman in their 40s, having a relatively routine hip surgery. Patient is otherwise healthy, except they take two antidepressants. They tell me that they don't smoke weed, they don't use any drugs, they don't smoke cigarettes, no methamphetamines, cocaine, heroin, nothing of the sort. Just two antidepressants, two serotonergic antidepressants specifically. We go to sleep with anesthesia, you know, that the mask goes on, we take those big deep breaths to fill up the oxygen in the lungs, like we do safely for any type of general anesthetic. We go to sleep with the breathing tube like this one, standard endotracheal tube, uneventful into patient. Patient is sleeping just fine. However, what happens about 10 minutes into the surgery? After induction, patient starts to twitch, move. And of course, everyone in the operating room freaks out, unfortunately. Anesthesia, the patient's moving. The surgery has not started yet. And the patient is on a full dose of anesthesia. Why is the patient moving and twitching before there's even any surgical incision? Well, that's a topic of today, the serotonin hypothesis. It's downfall, and what's wrong with SSRIs? When are they useful to use? When are they not useful to use? We're going to talk about SSRIs, the interactions under anesthesia. We're going to talk about side effects from SSRIs and SNRIs and other serotonergic antidepressants, the data for them, and... More importantly, what happens under anesthesia that demonstrates just how wrong the serotonin hypothesis is and how psychedelics offer a very different approach to antidepressant medications and treating depression and anxiety as a whole. Remember that depression and anxiety are very closely related. Depression is perseveration and rumination of the past. Anxiety is perseveration and rumination of the future. Of course, there's more to it, but that's a general framework that I use with my patients. And this patient in particular had more of the depressive side effects than the anxiety ones. And most importantly, they weren't taking other medications. At least they weren't reporting to me. I think, kind of hard to know, but I think about half a patient straight up don't say the truth for these questions. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just sharing the reality that oftentimes I find out after the fact that, oh, they were smoking a joint in the parking lot because when they come in afterwards, uh, someone tells me, or after we wake up from anesthesia, someone tells me, and I'm like, oh, well, that's why their heart rate was responding a certain way. Their breathing pattern was a certain way, why they had a bronchospasm or not. Often smoking cigarettes, they're just not honest with me. Now, I'm not blaming anyone, but I'm sharing a reality that for this individual patient, I'm going to go off of what they told me, that they did not use any other substances. So we can remove those variables. Why were they twitching and moving before any surgical stimulation while under a full, what we call MAC of anesthesia, a minimum alveoli requirement, meaning it's a solid dose. The average patient is asleep. Well, as you know, we've talked about in other videos, many factors go into determining anesthesia requirements. These are all population averages or spread, so it's not always the same for every individual. But that difference comes in with surgical stimulation. At that dose of anesthesia, the average individual is not going to move upon incision. But the average individual should not be moving before incision because the dose is that high. I hope that makes sense to everyone. And by the way, as I see everyone coming in, Michaela, Rebecca, Hannah, Chris, Paul, Sophia, great to see everyone on here. Uh, Philip, hello back from the San Francisco Bay Area. Sheila, uh, good to see you on here. So serotonergic, and in particular SNRI, so serotonergic and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors do appear to increase anesthesia requirements. Now we don't know why, because the first part of this serotonin <laughs> hypothesis is that it's an overly reduced form of our consciousness and our mood and disease in the brain and the body. If there's anything that I've appreciated as an anesthesiologist, it's that we have no clue what every chemical does because one, there are many chemicals that we have yet to discover, and two, 
There are many receptors for these chemicals that we have yet to discover. And three, these receptors are all over the body. Take serotonin, for example. We always think of serotonin in the brain. The serotonin hypothesis postulates, at least in part, that depression is mediated by changes of serotonin in the brain. Well, what about serotonin in the rest of the body? Did you know that your platelets have serotonin receptors? There are serotonin receptors throughout your smooth uh, muscle and throughout your body and your GI tract. In fact, we need to be concerned about bleeding risk in patients who are taking SSRIs. Now, it doesn't appear to be clinically significant, although it is statistically significant. So for a major blood loss surgery, we need to keep this in mind. Just goes to show that serotonin only in the brain is a far over simplification of the reality of the complexity of the human body. As is the thought that serotonin alone could mo modulate so much of something as complex as our mood, anxiety, depression, etc. Now, I mentioned the norepinephrine reuptake as well, because norepinephrine also appears to have some role in depression and anxiety. I'm not saying it doesn't, but I'm saying that overly reducing it to just two chemicals is kind of a joke in some ways. It doesn't mean that they're not helpful. We'll get to that in a moment. But we need to not be disingenuous with respecting the sanctity and dignity of our patients as more than just a bag of chemicals floating around in their brain. So when norepinephrine levels increase in the brain, we believe that increases anesthesia requirements. Hence why this individual, I suspect, was twitching and moving so much. Now, other factors can contribute. You know, red hair might increase the risk of anesthesia requirements, at least for sevoflurane gas. We know that EDS um, have, have some interactions with local anesthetics. Uh, there are a couple other mutations out there relatively rare, but the big ones are going to be substance use and medication use. By the way, benzodiazepines for anxiety increase anesthesia requirements when used chronically, as does uh, marijuana use, in particular high THC concentrations, probably much more than CBD alone formulations like CBD oil. So many things interact with our brain and how it sees anesthesia. Now, the problem with the SSRI hypothesis is that when we try to break down something as, as beautiful as an individual, as a patient that I'm trying to treat, just saying it's because of the serotonin, are we shortchanging the patient and giving them false hope by pushing a pill? Well, it turns out that in about a quarter of patients, every study, so it's a little bit of a different number, but it's going to be somewhere between 25 uh, and 50%. Uh, patients will get better with SSRIs. They do take about a couple months to kick in, for one. Two, they have lots of side effects. But most importantly, three, is that we don't know who is going to be in that 25 or 50 percent. So we're prescribing pills knowing that half the patients aren't going to get better from them and might suffer from their side effects. Uh, I see Venetia saying, I take SSRI, it doesn't work. Military veteran. Well, Venetia, uh, Venetia, thank you for your service, first of all. And you're certainly not alone because, like I just said, the majority of patients are probably not going to derive benefit, but many will have side effects. We know the side effects include, uh, include REM sleep disruption. So many depressed patients come to me with poor sleep, and now we're giving them a medication that might disrupt REM sleep more and contribute to insomnia. If it's an SNRI, we might be contributing to hypertension by increasing the levels of norepinephrine. By the way, this patient, when they were twitching, they were also hypertensive, and they were on an SNRI as one of their two medications. Gotta wonder, are we not really modulating the blood pressure in our patients when we're giving them SNRIs? Same for Adderall and other stimulants, by the way, that we use for ADHD. All those amphetamine-based medications also can increase blood pressure, and before you know it, if a patient has high blood pressure and they're on these medications, in the U.S. medical care system, we unfortunately don't try to peel back contributing medications. Instead, we'll add blood pressure medications onto that. So now instead of one medication, you have two, even though the cause of the blood pressure might have been from the medication. Not necessarily always, but might have been a contributor. Now, there's other side effects as well. The big one is going to be sexual dysfunction, decreased libido. In fact... Delayed orgasm is such a powerful side effect of SSRIs in particular that we prescribe SSRIs for patients that have early orgasm <laughs> because they're so predictable at delaying orgasm. 
you could imagine that sexual dysfunction might contribute to a patient who's already depressed for other reasons. Once again, I'm not anti-medication, but I am going to be critical when these medications disempower patients, giving them false hope and an external loci of control, and might contribute side effects all at the same time, especially when there are alternatives that we'll get to at the end. A recent Nature article, Nature is a very high impact journal that actually looked at the uh, evidence-based empirically of the serotonin hypothesis and does serotonin actually appear to correlate to depression? <laughs> 2022, so quite recent here. Their end conclusion, actually, I'll read it off for you. I'll read it off for you because it was so telling. The review suggests that the huge research effort based on the serotonin hypothesis has not produced convincing evidence of a biochemical basis to depression. This is consistent with research on many other biological markers, we suggest it is time to acknowledge that the serotonin theory of depression is not empirically substantiated. This is Nature 2022. I think most of us has know, have known for a long time that our psyche and our consciousness and our deep, deep felt emotions are not going to be reduced to just dopamine, just serotonin, just oxytocin, just norepinephrine. There's Certainly, there's only a finite number of neurotransmitters that we know, but there's a tremendous number that we probably don't know, and a tremendous number of receptor subtypes that we don't yet know. I'm not saying these aren't ineffective medications, and SSRIs and SNRIs can be life-saving when used appropriately, when looking at the patient as a whole. And that is what I advocate every patient to do, is to have a provider that recognizes that they're more than just a hormone bag of uh, you know, watering neurochemicals, that they're a human being with all sorts of past histories and narratives that have contributed to Ultimately, the patient I had on the operating room table. I'm not saying the SSRIs were incorrectly, uh, incorrectly um, prescribed for that individual, of course. But I'm saying there are effects that we need to be aware of when we're looking at the risks and benefits. The risks of undertreating depression are huge because we risk suicide. We risk cardiovascular disease. We risk early onset dementia for which we have no medications for. And we cannot just pretend it's not there. So we do need to treat depression, but are SSRIs always the answer? No. Are SNRIs or TCAs or MAOI inhibitors the answer? No, not always, certainly not on their own. So I promised to talk about what can potentially be far less harmful in the treatment of depression, hopefully have a better than 25% response rate. Well, I'm going to be honest, my bias is going to be towards anesthetics because I've seen the transformation that so many patients have, as I've shared on this show before. And we know that when patients have a change in perspective, whether it be through CVT, whether it be through psychodynamic psychoanalysis, whatever that tool might be to help change their perspective on themselves, recognize cognitive, uh, cognitive rigidities or behavioral loops that have precluded them from self-introspection or reflection, I mean, the list goes on. It's going to be individual to every individual who we're trying to treat. But psychedelics have a curious, curious, dirty receptor profile like anesthetic agents, whether it's sevoflurane or ketamine. We have never kid ourselves in anesthesia that we know what receptor is responsible for rendering a patient unconscious. We know it's a slew of receptors, all the ones that I mentioned earlier, not just serotonin. We know that serotonin can affect the whole body. We need to be mindful of giving serotonergic agents that might precipitate a serotonin syndrome, for example, which, by the way, affects the whole body, not just the brain. Because once again, these receptors are all over the body, and we kid ourselves in thinking that they only exist in the brain. Just like how we kid ourselves in <laughs> saying, oh, it's a patient who's depressed. It's like, no, they're a human being who has all sorts of beautiful life experiences, probably, who in the moment is challenged with depression, but we kind of lose the elegance of this patient if we just pop it down into something that easily fits into a medical transcript for a, a medical record somewhere. Now, psychedelics, unlike SSRIs, are not intended to be used lifelong or even daily or even for more than a couple of months. In an example, in my ketamine infusion clinic, we try to have patients have six sessions, at most 12 sessions, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis to give them sustained response. You tell me, if your brain is seeing a chemical every single day for 
three, five, 10, 15 years, like I see many patients on SSRIs, some appropriate, some inappropriate, how do you think the body's cumulative exposure and risk is compared to some brain that's seen ketamine, for example, 12 times in a year? Well, if it's anything similar to our data on anesthesia, we know that even children who have deep general anesthesia, high doses of ketamine, high doses of propofol, for one or two or three surgeries as a child, don't appear to have any lasting side effects because it's a one-time exposure in and out. This is very different than having a basal level of, for example, a serotonergic antidepressant in your blood in equilibrium with your brain through the blood brain barrier for years at a time. I'm not anti-medication, but I am anti putting our head in the ground and pretending like there aren't side effects to exposing our bodies to medications that might have safer alternatives out there. And I want you all to know that you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told for many physical health conditions, including cancer, as well as mental health conditions like depression. And the serotonin hypothesis strips away a lot of the empowerment of my patients at the risk of adding side effects. Uh, as always, you know, I don't do ad placement. I do depend on support from you all through likes, comments, sharing what you've learned with others, and subscribing to help keep up with my live streams like this and to also support me doing this more often. So thank you so much for your support. Let's get to the questions. 